you also work for fiction films and documentaries. Yes. And you're also a cinematographer. Yes. And both, both director and cinematographer. How do you deal with that? Uh, I think it's... I'm ac I actually graduated as a cinematographer. And uh, from my class in the film school, I was the only one who didn't want to become a director. <laughs> and, and, uh, but I was very young. But I, I think that uh, being so young, I was quite curious. So I tried to uh, experiment everything. And uh, at that time, we didn't, in the film school, we didn't have so strict, like uh, the cinematographers, the sound men, that uh, we were actually all together. And in the course, you could specialize with what you wanted. And then I specialized within the last two years in cinematography. And, uh, mm, so, uh, so actually, I have quite no good knowledge of editing, sound work. <laughs> I've also have done sound work. And, uh, and as I have a mathematical background, uh, the technique is very easy for me. And, uh, so uh, that made it a little bit different than for most of the girls in the school. Because at that time, as we didn't have the digital cameras, girls were very much afraid of, of the technique. But uh, I, I have kept doing cinematography ever since, and I, I shoot all my documentaries myself. Uh, that was what I was going to <laughs> ask you about your three rooms of melancholia because I know that you shot it yourself. Yes. And it was shot on film. It was shot on film. Yes. Uh, and uh, I think that all the documentaries I still want to shoot myself. And if I, I'm not quite sure what what I'm going to do next, but. In fiction, I have the feeling that the technique is so heavy, and there's a, such an enormous amount of lamps and and cranes uh, and uh, technicians in black clothes, which are rather frightening. That if you, if the director is behind the camera, you leave the actors too much alone. That is why, in fiction, I use a cinematographer, but. Then, like Peter was saying in the, uh, in the Q and A, that I prepare it extremely well, so that we know with the cinematography it's exactly what we are doing before we start shooting. And so we did with Peter that uh, we tested everything. We had um, I had shot examples of the lighting situations, which I prefer want to have in the film and uh, locations and uh, so uh, Peter was very uh, the cinematographer was very nice because he said before we start shooting that if you feel that you want to jump and go behind the camera uh, it doesn't hurt me you can do it but I, not once I had the feeling that, uh, that we simply already knew that we are making the same film. And an important person was Jani Lehtinen, who was a gaffer. And then, of course, uh, the, mm, the art director of the film. Uh, but everybody knew what, they are, what we are after. And, of course, then, uh, in the, while shooting, of course, we are open to changes. But basically, we knew very well what we were doing. And what's different with documentaries? I mean, what, why do you feel the need to do it yourself, both cinematography and directing? In, I think, uh, to me, in documentary, shooting comes very close to directing. And there, of course, you don't have the possibility to, to prepare the other one. Because uh, if something happens now, and that's why in documentary I also shoot very little. And, uh, I, I keep the camera on my shoulder a lot, but I very seldom press the button because uh, uh, at, 
I did, couldn't be that way if I would have a cameraman because they have to cover everything because, because it happens often very fast and you cannot negotiate with the director. You do you need this image or do you need that image? So I know it when I'm in the loop, I know, and then I don't take the shot if I feel I don't need it. <laughs> and how did it happen with Three Rooms of Melancholy? I mean, you, you have a, the subject is pretty risky. I yes. Mean, it was a risky ground there yes. you went to. I didn't do it because it was risky. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> I'm not a war sh cameraman. Uh, it's not yeah, my it's, 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 it's not my passion to, to be in in dangerous situations. But uh, but just the theme of the film, I couldn't avoid it. And, uh, so, but uh, how was the, the experience for you? What did it change? Did, did it change something? It was... Oh, well, it's a very long story. As it's very often is with documentaries. That it, it continued a lot of years after the film was ready. It was... Uh, in documentary, if you are shooting a documentary and people, it's natural that you get quite close to them. And when the film is ready, you cannot say just thank you and goodbye. <laughs> now I have milked you empty, goodbye. That you keep in contact with them. And in this case, the Chechenian people, uh, they ended up in a terrible situation where they, their life was risked and they were put to prison. And, and uh, I never would have believed of course, then I had to mix into this process to save them. And nowadays, they all live in Helsinki. All of them? The all children, the children that appear in your yeah, film? Some of the children, we couldn't get out of the country. But, uh, uh, so they, They, they now have a permission to stay in Finland because of political reasons and the children speak Finnish. <laughs> okay. I never would have believed it. It's an unreal story, but, but there was no, no other way to keep them alive. And how, how <laughs> were you able to enter both Russia and Chechenia? I mean, it's... We were kicked out many times. And uh, we tried to make everything legally, but it was not possible. At the end, we had to decide that either we ha don't have a film or then we go underground. That we, uh, that, uh, pride <laughs> yeah, it happens. Uh, yeah, but it was the only way. And, uh, because it. The system in Russia got more tight all the time, and Putin's regime started to in really influence the freedom to shoot and, and the freedom to express. It was very clear that, and as we ha have seen that in Russia, it's gone worse and worse all the time. When we started, we didn't have much difficulties, but all the time, of course, it got more difficult. And did you know your characters beforehand? Before to know my to know your characters. I mean the children. No, 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 no. Uh, I had just a, I had a theme, which was uh, mm, it's it was an American producer who wanted to make a, a documented sex uh, series of. The Ten Commandments, uh, like Kislovsky had done in fiction, and he invited ten, of course, ten, because there are ten, <laughs> ten directors, and I was one of the invited, and I then picked up the uh, commandment: "Don't bear false witness on thy neighbor," uh, which I thought was the most interesting one. But with the American producer, we could not agree with the final cut because I was definite that I want to keep the final cut, that I'm not going to make a film 
where the American producer has the final cuts. And then he came to Helsinki, and we were uh, we were arguing for a few hours in a five-star hotel. And I said, no, I'm not going to sign this agreement. And then he said, Pirio, I opened you the heaven's gate, and you are too stupid to walk in. <laughs> then I just walked out, and I didn't have a producer anymore. But but I had a topic, which was the, the mm, this the one commandment of the Degalog, which was don't bear false witness on thy neighbor. And uh, then I, I remember it was snowing, and I was standing on the street, and I pick up a phone and called to a Finnish female producer and said, how about if we start to collect money? <laughs> but I think it would have been totally immoral to give the final cut to the American producer, because if you shoot ordinary people, the, the fact that they allow you to shoot is that they trust you. And uh, to give it to some American pr producer could, who could use it for anything, you can't do that. But it's the American way. They never give the final cut to the director. It's, it, it, that's, that's how European cinema has differed from the American cinema. That in America, a film is a product, and the product is owned by the one who keep, puts the money in it. And it doesn't matter if it's a sausage or a soap. They decide what comes out. And uh, in Europe, it has been. Uh, work of art, where the director has the immaterial rights. Not the material, but the immaterial rights. And that way, uh, the, the final say to what is going to be uh, the cut, and uh, how, how it's going to be. So there I face the, the very essential difference between American and, uh, and European thinking. And I, I think that's one of the reasons why European films look different. But now we are in the risk. The young filmmakers mostly don't have the possibility to, to be as strict as I have been. That's, uh, particularly TV stations, they don't want to give the final cut. Usually the, uh, mm, like we have, most countries have national institutes. They, they don't put fingers in, even though they might give much more money. But the television stations don't want to sign agreements where the director has final cut. I think it's a big fight which we should, we should fight for that because it makes the film different. Yeah, it totally does. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Pirio, okay. for the interview. <laughs> okay. Thank you.